My name is Linda Vallejo. I was born in Los Angeles. When I was three years old, I moved to Germany. <laughs> my father was a, my father's name is Adam C. Vallejo. My mother's name is Helen. And my dad graduated from UCLA in 1951 and uh, was a part of the ROTC and joined the Air Force. He was in the Air Force for 28 years. Uh, he just uh, completed his term, 28 year term. About uh, three years ago, he went back to UCLA and uh, got a degree in law, and now he's a partner in a law firm. I moved all over the United States and Europe through all of my childhood with my father in the Air Force. I spent um, three years in Germany, so my first language was German, and my second language was English. And I finally learned Spanish when I went back to Madrid in uh, when I was 15 and 67, 67. Uh, I lived in uh, Missouri, Texas, Arizona, Maryland, Pittsburgh, Alabama, Sacramento, Los Angeles, Madrid, uh, two terms in Madrid, about three and a half years in España, which I was really happy for because uh, Chicanos have to uh, work in terms of their relationship with their mestizo. And uh, going to España and beginning to understand a bit of the history of the people, some of the sangre of the people, some of the, the just the culture and the everyday people of España is very important in terms of understanding ourselves and the whole history of Mexico and where we came from. So I was very happy for that. Um, I have one brother named Thomas. He's in uh, law school and a sister named Roseanne and she's a law secretary. So a lot of my familia is in law and uh, very much involved in education. My father was uh, a very strong advocate of education. And my first uh, exclamation to my family when I was seven years old was at Thanksgiving dinner was that I was going to go to college and I was going to be an artist. And I've never changed my mind, not one iota all my life. I was very happy for that because I felt that the creator has really given me an avenue to express my uh, experiences and my being in a very colorful and beautiful way, being an artista, even though it's a very difficult life, it's a beautiful life. And uh, so I spent almost all of my life alone. Uh, as the eldest, I spent a great deal of time by myself studying in school, uh, studying music and art. I got uh, my bachelor's from Whittier College graduated from Madrid High School in Spain, came back and went to Whittier College for four years, then went back to Madrid and studied uh, lithography at the University of Madrid, and then came back and went and got my MFA at uh, Cal State University Long Beach in printmaking. All of that time, I sort of intermingled all the arts together, which is part of where I feel my life is going in terms of an understanding of the arts and the importance of the arts, especially within a Chicano tradition, because I feel that like our our blood comes back to us, no matter how far away we've been taken, whether to Germany at three years old or all around the world and all different types of languages and peoples and cultures, our blood and our ancestry come back to us in a very firm and honest way through the heart. And um, I was involved in theater and uh, music, and I still enjoy writing uh, music when I get a chance. And I have a couple of songs that I've been working on over the last couple of years. But the majority of my um, professional uh, experience and educational training has been in visual arts, printmaking, uh, painting and drawing, sculpture. Uh, and I have a minor out of college, which was a surprise to me in philosophy and religion. I didn't know I had that until I graduated and saw how many uh, units I had carried. And uh, it was philosophy and religion. All, all through, I think one of the most important parts to mention about my upbringing and my entrance into the Chicano world, the Chicano world, is that no matter where I went, I always was very interested in um, going to the cathedrals, going to the monuments, going to the, uh, the sacred places of all the different cultures and peoples that I was interested in, 
going to the uh, the sites, uh, for instance, Rome. I went to Rome and really loved it, really appreciated all the art and the beauty of the city, all the history of the city. And going to Mexico in the last recent years, since my understanding of the cultura mexicana and chicana, I was, of course, totally drawn to the piramides and to the historia, the uh, all the pre-Hispanic peoples from, you know, the the Nahuatl peoples and the Mexica peoples and the Mayan peoples, all of those centers that carry the real, the connection, the connection with the, might say, universal forces or creative forces or unspoken languages. And I was a great, uh, I had a great interest in Egyptology for quite a few years and did a lot of study in uh, uh, pyramid work, uh, numerology, numbers, and uh, a lot of the history that's been buried, that's been sort of blanched out in the last, uh, say, five centuries, and been kept away from a lot of us in terms of understanding uh, what humankind has gone through to come to the place that it is now. Um, I was always really taken by grave sites and uh, tombs. Uh, places that they didn't have any explanation for, quote unquote, like Stonehenge. And uh, how did man or how did human people make this structure? How was it possible to make such a structure? And all the mystery, I've always been very much attracted to the concept of the mystery. So I really feel, as I get older, I really appreciate, although it was a very difficult upbringing, uh, to always be somehow different. I always felt myself somehow different from the people around me. Brought up a lot around uh, uh, Anglo peoples and black peoples and Asian peoples, but very rarely any Mexican people or Chicano peoples. And I really didn't come into any contact with Chicanismo or Chicano people until I was about 25 years old. Which kind of puts me right on the brink because I'm only 32 now, so it's been about seven years since I became consciously involved with the concepts of Chicanismo. My family still lives in Los Angeles. A lot of my, my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my great aunts and uncles. And that's the reason why I levitated back towards Los Angeles. Um, I think we all have a, an inner need to reconnect with our, you know, our tatas and come back and hear the old stories, the stories about your parents and the stories about your great grandfather and where he came from, and the history of the familia. So when I came back to California, I decided to settle in L.A. so that I could reconnect with my, my family, since I'd been away for so long, for so long, along with my dad and my mom and my family. Oh, well, another thing that I think is uh, kind of important in terms of understanding me is that I moved out of my, my family's home when I was 15 to go to a boarding school, which is pretty unusual upbringing for a Chicana woman. To suddenly be out on her own, responsible for herself at 15 is, and not married, is pretty unusual in my generation. Nowadays, I, I believe it's a lot different. Women have a lot more um, choice and a lot more, uh, less fear in terms of choice and feel that they can be more independent, which I think is good. And I learned a lot about independence for myself as a woman in terms of making my own choices at a very early age. And I'm very, I'm very grateful for that, although it was, it was difficult. Uh, during many times, it was hard. In the long run, I think it's given me a lot of the strength and the stamina and the direction that I think an artista, an artist, no matter what culture they come from, really needs to be able to stay with art. Because a lot of people want to give it up because it's such a hard road. You have to sacrifice so much. But if you're used to being alone and pushing yourself a lot, pushing yourself to do it, then after a while it sort of becomes like a second skin. So I lived a lot of years uh, in, first in the dormitory in, Ma in Madrid and um, designed some clothes when I was there. When I was 16, I hit the streets with some, uh, with some cloth clothing designs, thinking that I could uh, begin myself in a market, which now that I look back, that's pretty gutsy for a 15, 16-year-old. And... Um, I think Madrid was a very good experience for me. I know the people, the Chicanos that I know, a friend of mine's out there this year, as a matter of fact, and he sent me a postcard commenting on how 
a good artist, as a matter of fact, Tony Portillo from uh, San Pedro, commenting on how similar the architecture of Spain is as it is to Mexico. And uh, a lot of the adobe style houses were on the outside, they're very plain and you don't see anything but a small doorway. And then when you walk in, there's a large courtyard and all of the tile work and the center plaza and the second story rooms and a large kitchen and the family area. And uh, he was pretty much astounded by that. I think a lot of the spiritu of the, our people, I think that's probably why the Espanolas and the, and the uh, pre-Hispanics were destined to meet because the spirit is so strong, it's so similar. Uh, when I was living in Spain, a lot of people used to think I was a gitana, which is a half-breed over there too, right? Because <laughs> uh, the Moros, you know, married into the Anglos and created this blood, and it looks much like us, very dark and uh, morenos, muy morenos. And the flamenco is a very strong danza that, that, that is their danza, and it's a... Uh, now the Espanolas take it on because it's probably one of the most fiery and most beautiful parts of the culture of España, but it's really that mixture, that mestizo once again. Okay, first sure. Okay. I think the point I was trying to get to was that I even was mistaken once to be Japanese, if you can believe it, and uh, Portuguese, Hawaiian, Filipina, they say that uh, the Chicano peoples are cosmic peoples, and uh, the mestizo blood in us is of all races and of all peoples. And I think the most important, one of the most important things that I gathered from all of those combination of experiences that I was put through, at the time it appeared as if I was being put through things, even though I enjoyed all the different foods and all the different places and the excitement of moving and changing places, is the very important aspect of being one with all human beings. Being Chicano, for sure, because that's who you are, but still feeling a brotherhood or a sisterhood, a humanhood with all peoples and all groups around the world. And I know that I've spoken to some Chicanos that still hold a grudge against the Espanolas, and I can really, I can hear that. You know, you read the books and you really you get angry, you know. What would have happened to the Aztecas if that hadn't come down, you know? And, the reality of history just becomes too apparent. So I once said that I was glad that I went to España before I came over to Chicanismo because I don't have the Espanol chip on my shoulder. And I think it's helped me to be more universal in my voice, in terms of my artistic voice, and in the goals that I have for myself. When I say my prayers, I say prayers for all people, for all children. And when I think of the you know, the African children that are dying every day, my heart goes out to them. When I think of the children in Guatemala, my heart goes out to them. When I think of the boat people, poor boat people driven from their homes, my heart goes out to them. And so I hope to make work. I think my, my experience of so many cultures and so many peoples is the end point of my work. I'm a, I'm a developing artist. As I said earlier, I'm young. There's so many people, veteranos and veteranas, who have been around for 20 years in the movimiento and the movement of Chicanismo, who have this incredible background and understanding, and thereby have a much clearer vision, really total vision of their work and their life. Because of all my experiences as a young person, I think I have another decade or two to experience before I really begin to say the things that I really want to. But I hope in my study and in my work with other peoples, that, and especially through the Chicanismo, because that's what I'm passing through now, that I will reach that point where my statements will be totally universal and be uh, a good statement and a good prayer for all, all peoples, human, humankind. And uh, I think understanding a little bit about my history and my upbringing would help, would help you to understand about my work, um, some of the images that I choose, the ways that I choose to incorporate some people or the ways that I choose to incorporate color or imagery or form in a lot of ways have no specific culture. Well, one of the gentlemen on your very own crew said, doesn't anybody ever come up to you and say they've never seen anything like this before or what is this or someone walked up to me to that piece in my home and said, is this glass? It's kind of like that. It's very provocative still. It's, it's still maturing, kind of like an 
a small ovum becoming a human being. That's how I see the work. Okay, so it's born just like a human being, and it's a small egg, and it grows and matures into a being. And even a child, when it leaves the womb, it has nine months to mature. They say that a child matures nine months in the womb and nine months outside of the womb. It's that whole cycle. It gets its eyebrows and its eyelashes and its hair color and its eye color all outside of the womb, all outside. So there's, it's constantly on a maturing level, just like a human being. Yeah, I think your artwork matures with you. It's kind of like... Um, Kind of like your body. It's like a separate body, like you carry around your spirit with you, and it's in the image of your artwork. And people see you through your work and see your um, understanding of the world through your work, see your experiences through your work. It's like me and my shadow. Hopefully it's a rainbow shadow, right? Not a black shadow, but a rainbow shadow. I noticed a lot, too, that um, in ancient cultures, all ancient cultures, whether it's Hindu or... Uh, you know, uh, Chinese or African, South American, Hawaiian. My God, the Hawaiian peoples, what a beautiful people. The colors are very vibrant and very distinct, and geometrical patterns are everywhere, the archetypal imagery. And so I've zeroed in on a lot of that uh, and enjoyed utilizing that over and over and over again as maybe the beginning of that little ovum's life to understanding what the message is in the use of all the cultures within uh, geometrics, pure color, not muddied color. That's one of the things I don't like about 20th century work. United, what I call United States culture, 20th century artwork, is there's a lot of grays around. I see a lot of gray in the palette. And... Uh, I think art heals. And if you go back to iconography, as we were speaking earlier, and with my experiences in cathedrals and in mosques and in oh, all kinds of holy or religious or, or spiritual places or locations, um, you find that there's one, uh, one experience that comes to my mind is that I was in, um, in España, and I was in... Uh, El Alhambra, which is a uh, really large uh, Moorish castle, and it's like in perfect condition. They've, thank God, they've kept it. And uh, all over the walls, there's this escrito, it's this little escrito everywhere with very bright colors everywhere, escrito. And uh, one of the very first forms that I chose in my artwork comes back to the umbilical cord too. This long, like a little wire, this little line, this little escrito was uh, from that uh, written, the written word of people, writing, numbers. They're all, they all connect together, writing and numbers. And uh, so I started writing a lot of things when I was just beginning my, my portfolio's work. And if you look at my latest sculpture and stuff, you still see all these little squiggly lines everywhere. It seems to come up in a lot of places. And uh, I'd hope to think that that my work heals in the same way that the artwork heals in those other, in those beautiful places. Like if you go to the Pyramides in Mexico and you sit with the Pyramides for a few moments, if you're lucky, a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, you can feel the energy of these beautiful places and the, the sacredness of those places. And the artwork there, and the artisanos that worked there on those things were healers through their work, creating places that people gave thanks, asked for special, asked their special prayers for their family or the health of their people, made sacrifice for life and the goodness of life and the beauty of life. That seems to me to be what could possibly be the most beautiful part about being an artist if you look at it in that way. And going back to using pure color, the Pyramides were once painted in brightest, glorious color. Trajes, you know, the danzantes that still dance in Mexico for the Virgen de Guadalupe, use very bright colors on their trajes and mirrors to glow light. Bright light reflect the sun's light. 
if you look at Japanese kimonos, you see bright, beautiful color and swirling line. I've been getting into beadwork lately, and I have a book on beadwork. And you look at uh, North American brothers, you know, Indian brothers beadwork, and you'd swear it was Yugoslav or German or Danish. The women that wear those flowing skirts, those kinds of the threads of those universal images that seem to flow within all cultures around the concept of fiesta, ceremonia, um, festival, uh, saints' days, uh, special thanks in terms of like equinox days or the change of the seasons or the the harvest days or the upbringing of the children, which is a very important part in just about every culture, is the upbringing of the children and the teaching of the children and the proper ways of being a good adult, being a good parent, being a good sister, being a good mother, being a good friend. The health, all around the health, there's a lot of, a lot of ceremonies traditionally that are used for healing. If an artist, okay, that's a very big picture, right? That's a very big picture. And then you talk about being a singular artist and trying to address the concept of that picture, which is, like I said, very big. And thank God I'm still just a small child and I have two more decades. That's the line I have drawn for myself to be able to accomplish a statement that would really begin to encompass that.